What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of On The Mic with Michael Flicks. Very, very excited. Very, very happy to be doing this. I mean, y'all know I've been waiting a long time for this interview, man. I'm sitting down with NBA champion, San Diego native, Norman Powell. I appreciate up, you brother, chopping up with me, bro. Appreciate you taking the time and having me on. Absolutely, man. It's a long time right. coming for me, man. This yeah. is a low-key a dream come true interview for oh, me, man. man. I appreciate <laughs> you, bro. I appreciate, oh, man. I appreciate you, man. That, man. How everything going with you, man? How's your summer been? Uh, summer's been crazy, um, but everything's good, man. I've been doing a lot of traveling, uh, a lot of working out, a lot of grinding. Um, still getting my workouts in when I'm on the move. Um, a lot of setting things up for the community back home, um, doing my, my foundation stuff. So today, um, just finished up my, my, my camp mm -hmm. uh, for the youth. Um, so it's been a busy summer for me. Hey, hey. How, much, uh, how much time do you give yourself to just kind of decompress? Like after the season is over, how many weeks do you go with no basketball? <sighs> Man, um, with no basketball, probably mm -hmm. uh, maybe just like two weeks, oh, okay. honestly. Mm -hmm. um, in those two weeks, probably a week of it is is where I'm not doing anything, just letting my body recover. And then after that, I go right into body management, uh, which is uh, hot Pilates, yoga, um, some PT and stuff, making sure my body's straight before getting back on the court. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I um, I didn't realize how, how big of a deal all that extracurricular stuff was. Cause mm -hmm. A lot of people think it's just, you know, like get your rest and like stay off the court, stay off your feet. Yeah. But it's a lot that goes into taking yeah. care of the body. Nah, you know? I mean, a lot goes into it. You know, um, I think a lot of people just see the, the, the in, in the lights and, and mm -hmm. what we do and what's showcased uh, on, on YouTube or on Instagram. But there's a lot of things behind the scene um, that you got to do and making sure your body is, is up to up to par. You're mm -hmm. in shape. Um, all the nicks and bruises are good to go, not only just for the summer grind, but for the duration of the season as well, you know, because um, once the season starts, there's really no rest, you know, you got games back to back, you're playing every other night, four games in, in five nights, five games in seven nights, um, so the, the body management uh, piece of it, uh, especially in the summer, is really huge, so you can be ready for the season. Mm -hmm. I now, I said after a certain point, everyone's playing injured. Yeah. At what point do you think, like, at what point in the season do you think, like, most guys are playing injured? Um, I think probably after, like, game 25. Okay, you know, wow. Um, guys, guys are, 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 are pretty bruised up, banged up. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that's why you see, like, the slow development of the season. You know, like, the pace starts to pick up, you mm -hmm. know, later and later you get into the season and right around um, all-star break, that's when, when guys are and teams are, are really ready to make that push into the postseason for the seeding and placement and the standings. You know, you want to be gearing up, you know, for that postseason push. Hey, hey, interesting, interesting. Let's take it all the way to the start with you, Norm, all the way to the beginning. Now, obviously, you're from San Diego, born and raised right here in southeast San Diego. At what point did you, uh, who put the ball in your hand and at, at what age were you when you started playing? Um, so, my uncle... Um, and my dad put the ball in my hand. Um, my uncle uh, took over as the father figure in my life. Um, I was raised by my mom as a single, in a single parent household, but um, on, on occasions when my dad would uh, pop up in my life, um, he would take me over to the base um, or, or up in Miramar and I would we'd go on the court and I'd play against the older guys that were um, in the service. Um, and I think that kind of like started to prepare me for you know, uh, that, that next level, you know, you're playing against guys who are bigger, stronger, and I'm, you know, eight, seven, eight, nine, trying to figure it out, you know, mm -hmm. getting mad at myself, uh, kicking the ball all over the place, pouting, crying. <laughs> um, and so that experience with my dad, uh, I think, started to, to shape uh, the mentality. And then my uncle, um, as I got a little older and um, he became uh, the prominent male figure in my life, he was taking me up to Balboa Park and I was playing one on one with him. Okay. And my uncle uh, was six, eight. About 250, 260. Like, he was, like, built like, yeah, a, yeah. like a DN. And um, I would go up against him, and I could never beat him in one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I'd be so pissed, and I'd be out there all day uh, trying to beat him. And I think he let me win a few games just so we could leave. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's, that's, where, that's where it all started with, with those two. But um, the passion and, and drive of uh, wanting to play basketball and wanting to be at the top level um, was all a little kid. You know, a lot of people don't know I started – running track. My mom was big in the track and field and she forced me and my sisters uh, to run track. You know, mm -hmm. kind of like the King Richard, the uh, Venus and Serena. Oh, okay, Brothers. okay. Like, we didn't want to be out there, but my mom made it. Mm -hmm. Made us uh, go out there and, and be a part of track and field. And I think that development actually played a part into the grand scheme of things in my athleticism. Okay. How, how, uh, how long did you run track? Um, I ran track from a youth. Like when I was wait, five, six, when they were doing uh, 
uh, the little, the little uh, I can't remember the name of them, but they had us doing the little sprints. You know, it's like 25, mm -hmm. uh, half of the 100, you know, um, and we was out there running around. I started very young. My mom grew up on, on track, so uh, she had her own uh, track and field team. We was track and field team uh, uh, called In Flight. Um, before she was doing with um, Alexander Express and then um, uh, her friend with Miss Elizabeth uh, Flojo. Um, so we were all around the whole uh, uh, track and field uh, growing up. Oh, did you run in high school? I didn't run in high school. That was like, after I was able to um, uh, break away from it, I had uh, hurt my groin um, going into high school and uh, I made the full transition over to basketball. Uh, after that, I was like, man, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm mm -hmm. just going to solely focus on basketball. This is what I really want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and she really didn't know much about basketball. She really didn't know how to get me into the avenues and things like that. But I had a coach uh, that was at the Boys and Girls Club when I was in uh, elementary school, um, Coach Stacy Dooley. He was my first basketball coach. And um, uh, he really, you know, uh, helped me, like, develop. And a few years later, we, like, had lost connection a little bit. A few years later, um, he was coaching at San Diego All-Stars. And so he would bring me up uh, to um, SDA and I'd play against the older guys at AIU. Um, and when I got to high school, uh, we reconnected again. And that's when I started playing for SDA. And um, that was like the start of the full development of my basketball. So around, around high school is when you started to take it serious? Yeah. So I, I mean, I always took it serious. Like I was always... Um, waking up early in the morning when like no no guidance right like I was just uh, literally sitting down watching uh, you know the old like, a lot of basketball players say all right we're watching video of Kobe Mike all their favorite players but I was literally sitting up hours um, and I don't know if uh, many people uh, remember the m m the movie that Mike had a little documentary on him Michael Jordan to the max I do and I used to watch that literally probably like five six times a day on repeat wow like, on repeat man because I just used to like sit there and imagine like I want that like it's so mm -hmm. cool I thought it was so dope to see uh, a guy like him with such like passion driving his skill set and just the way he was able to to motivate and, and move you know not just just a few people but the world you know and I, and I wanted that and I wanted to be at that level um, so that passion was always there um, but it was just trying to figure out how to get there so I'd be waking up super early leaving notes with my mom I lived in Spring Valley for a second and we had an old uh, broken down court um, on the back right behind our, uh, our condo that I'd walk to um, in the morning with my basketball and I would just sit there and first imagine and, and see myself you know, at that next level and then I would go out and, and, and copy and mimic all the moves that Kobe was doing, all the shots that Kobe was doing, all the shots MJ was doing, all the moves AI was doing and magic and, and that, that's where like, the passion started and then went, I got some guidance from people who were you know, involved in the game that kind of helped me direct and figure out my path. Mm -hmm. Now, you said you had the passion and you wanted to be at that level and you just needed to figure out how. When you say figure out how, was this something where, like, you felt like your skill set wasn't translating or was the passion there? Like, the skill set was already there and you just knew there was more work to do. Uh, that, that was just uh, more work to do, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I don't think I was the most skilled growing up, but mm -hmm. I just had, I had this image in my head that I was going to, I was gonna be there, you know, and, and and like nobody could tell me differently, you know. It's just I didn't know, like I didn't know, like I wasn't involved in AAU at the time when I was growing up, coming through elementary and middle school. I didn't get involved in AAU until uh, my sophomore, going into my junior year, you know. And okay. for uh, youth, that's 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 really late. That's really late. You know? yeah. So uh, there was just no no guidance, and like we're gonna get you in this camp, we're gonna get you in the top, we're gonna get you in Adidas Nations. Like I didn't have any of that, mm -hmm. you know. I just didn't know how to get there. I just knew that. This was my goal, and it was going to happen. You know, and things just started to fall into place. You meet the right people, you meet the right coaches, uh, uh, at the right spot at the right time. Like when I got to SDA, uh, I was at CIF watching uh, the the championships uh, for San Diego, and uh, coach there uh, pulled me, got me involved, and talked to my mom. And mom was like, "Hey, if you're going to pay and, and get him there, he's all for it." So it was just being at the right place at the right time that helped direct the path and putting me in the right situations. Um, but I, yeah, it was just like I didn't know how to get there. I just had to figure it out. Okay. At what point? At what point did you realize that that you were pretty good at basketball? That you were better than most? Um, I think that's the problem. I thought I was better than most. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, always. Like, and, and, and it's funny because uh -huh. everybody's like, "Oh, like what's that moment?" Uh -huh. Like, like 
Like I said, when I was going to the to the park and everything, like I had this like ego already, and I think it was from watching so much Kobe, gotcha. and watching so much mentality that like you know you you only seeing what you see on YouTube and what people are putting together. Mm-hmm. You don't really see the backstory. So when you're looking at him, like uh, you, you hear him calling like like he's egotistic, you know, um, you can't coach him, you know, he's he's cocky. Like that's how I was like, oh. He's this way, and that's my role model. I have to be like that. Oh, I that's see. So I would carry myself like I that. See, so it wasn't like a moment. It was just like it was who I am. So mm-hmm. when I got to Lincoln, um, it was actually a problem uh-huh. because like I wasn't listening to the coaches. <laughs> I was getting into it with, with the players. Like, like man, I'm better than you. I ain't trying to hear nothing you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it got so bad where I had to get an intervention. Like the coaches put me to the side. Like, hey, look, man, you're gonna have to fix your attitude, or like you're not gonna be able to play. Um, and they had to send me down from from I was a freshman. Um, I should have been playing on JV. I got sent down from mm. JV to freshman because me and my boy Kev, uh, we sprinting, we doing suicides, and dudes ain't touching the lines. And now I'm getting mad, right? Because I'm doing it right, and now we running five, six, seven more suicides. So I'm like, man, I got me messed up. Like I'm too good to be doing this. Uh-huh. And so I start jogging and walking, and we get into it with the coach, and the coach sends me down to freshman. And uh-huh. I'm like, man, whatever. I'll go down to freshman. Uh-huh. I don't worry about this. Y'all need me. <laughs> like, I, like, I'm too good for this. I'll go down to freshman. I'll have a good time. Yeah. So like, I always had that, that mentality that, that like, I was better than everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How, <laughs> how long was that mentality able to stick around being here at Lincoln? Um, it stuck the whole time. Oh, wow. and, and, okay. and after the intervention, you know, like, I calmed down and just like in terms of like being coachable you know and and taking a step back and knowing that you know i'm not the smartest in the room but uh my approach and my mentality to the game that that never changed you know that that didn't change but it was more like all right like this is what i want to do and this is what they're saying i need to fix and in order for me to to do what i want to do and what i love i got to fix these things right? i got to fix my attitude i got to fix how I, I communicate and interact with my teammates um, so I think that that was the adjustment, but my approach here was was the same. Like it, it didn't matter who was who was there. I was, being a freshman, going against the seniors, I never backed down. Mm-hmm. Like Mike Ross, uh, we had Kyle, uh, we had we had a stack, we had a loaded team coming in because at Lincoln we had just opened up, so mm-hmm. everybody came back. So mm-hmm. we had uh, Ronnie Yale, Victor Dean, like we had a, a squad, right? So um, I, I never backed down to them. It, they didn't they didn't phase me. I was just. Mm-hmm. I feel I felt I was just built built differently. Hey, hey. Now you say you played played started J V and then went down to freshman. Mm-hmm. It was in tenth grade you went to varsity. Yeah, tenth is grade, it, uh yeah, I went to varsity. Is that when uh, recruitment started or when did your recruitment kinda of pick yeah, up? Yeah, my my recruitment didn't start until after that. Okay. Uh, my recruitment didn't start till um after that uh, sophomore uh season going into my summer. Uh man uh when I was playing with S D A uh and we had played in a tournament, um in LA, Orange County, and we played against Modern Day, and um, we were playing up, up. And Modern Day, what they do, they travel with their high school team, right? Mm-hmm. So um, in that tournament, um, we were playing against Modern Day, and we we're playing against Tyler Lamb, uh, one of my teammates that uh, when I uh, ended up going to UCLA, and he was, uh, I want to say like top 50, uh, maybe even top 25 in his class. And I mean, we got, we were getting smacked by like 40. We were getting smacked by 40, but I had 30. Mm-hmm. So like, I was the only one cooking. Uh-huh. And, like, you know, all the, all the scouts and stuff were there watching him. Um, but I had, a, I had a big play against him. I ripped him up top, and I came down, and I, and I came off two, and I dunked it. I dunked it on the call to foul. Um, and that play right there, I think, kind of, like, put me on the map of people. Like, oh, who is this kid? Like, like what is he about? Um, but it wasn't until uh, my sophomore summer going into my, my junior years when the recruitment started coming okay. in. Okay. Do you remember who the, the first school was to reach out? Um, San Diego State. Okay, nice. San Diego State was the first school um, that reached out. Um, then it was, like, the, the USD, UCSD. Um, mm-hmm. San Diego State was the first school to, to reach out and offer me a scholarship. Mm-hmm. Dope, dope. 2010, you win a state championship. Mm-hmm. That's got to be pretty dope. Tell me what that what that experience is like winning a state championship. Oh uh, man, it was amazing. And I think um, I think we could have won the state championship uh, uh, maybe my my sophomore year as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we lost to uh, Oceanside uh, my, my sophomore year. But um, going into that junior year, I mean, we were loaded. All the guys that came in as a freshman, we like. We had a team where all 12, 13 guys could have played and started um, at any team in San Diego School District. Like, we were loaded. Me, we had Javante, we had Kevin, we had um, Tyree, Tyrell, we had um, Victor Dean. No, not, we didn't have Tyree, we had Victor, we had uh, Nate Maxey, um, Cody Namani. We had a loaded squad and uh, Josh Smith. I mean, we had 
everybody. And each one of us could have started and been the man of our own team. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was super dope that, um, one, we all stayed together because, like, you know how it is. Like, for sure. oh, we don't get an opportunity. Like, we're going to go. Mm -hmm. We're going to go transfer and go play for Morris. We're going to go play for Madison. You know, teams are diff or teams and coaches are trying to pull us different directions and because we were so loaded. But we stuck together and was able to do something special. I mean, we brought the... The only uh, state championship uh, in basketball at Lincoln since 1994, I believe. Yeah, mm -hmm. up there on the banner, 94. I had to look to make sure I wasn't wrong. So um, to be able to, to have um, history made here at Lincoln and kind of put that stamp back that we're here and a force to be reckoned with was, was an amazing time. That's dope. That's dope. And now this past season, you were able to, to bless your school with a gym and the um, with a gym with a floor, and they dedicated the floor to you. I was able to be here for that game. That was that was a really yeah. cool experience to be here for. Man. Um, Honestly, I, uh, they blessed me with the floor. Oh, okay, I got, I got it backwards. The okay, yeah, okay. They, they, uh, Coach Jeff um, had messaged me about it. We talked about it. I thought he was, you know, messing around. And uh, uh, he had sent me, like, like mock-ups and different layouts and stuff like that. So um, I kind of, like, kept it a secret. I, I said, hit my boys that um, we came to school with, uh, went to school here with. And I was like, yo, what y'all think about the designs? Y'all think it's this way, that way? Um, and uh, I didn't know when it was going to happen, how he was going to set it up. Uh, but when uh, he started showing me, like, the, the development of it, and when I came down, I honestly, I, I kind of, like, forgot that like, he had did it. Mm -hmm. And that when I, when I came down to watch my nephew play, mm -hmm. I didn't know that they were going to do, like, the whole, like, ceremony for it and um, unveil it. It, it. it was amazing. Like, it's still surreal, you know, coming in here and seeing not only, like, my name, but, like, my brand and who I'm about, you know, understanding the grind. Um, has been a lifestyle model uh, for me and my boys uh, growing up uh, as just a mental approach and, and focus and, and how we want to approach our daily lives and go after our dreams and goals. So to have that here and uh, and I'm all about the community, all about helping the next generation of kids and having that stamp and mark to show them how to do it and how to go after their dreams and goals. Um, it, it's a surreal um, experience and moment for me, even every single time I step in here. Really cool, man. Really cool. Now, speaking of speaking of it, your your you know your brand, understand the grind. You have the understand the grind foundation. Mm -hmm. Does amazing things not only here in Southeast San Diego but all over San Diego. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the understand the grind foundation, what it is, and you know what it does, and everything. Yeah. So uh, I mean, understand the grind. Like I said, uh, you know, started uh, with me and my boys. You know, um, and we were talking, uh, and one of my boys um, was saying, like, man, like we're so surprised that like not everybody makes it you know you have so many big names that are coming out of san diego that you know are, are supposed to be the next big thing you know they're supposed to uh, be the next hooper hoop star hope next football player whatever it is and um throughout the years you know you kind of like man what happened like, like what happened to that person and uh, no shots against anybody you know everybody you know has their own uh life path and goes through different things but my boy was like man a lot of people don't understand the grind and i'm like kind of hit home with me you know what I'm saying like like in those three simple words you know like it means a lot you know the what what it takes you know to be successful how how to be successful how to how to go after your dreams how to navigate life you know it's all a grind it's all different things that are, are going to be thrown at you and how do you weave your way through it and overcome obstacles um to get to where you want to be um and that's how it, it, it started you know and uh, we just took that I took that in and broke it down more like what is understand the grind for me personally, right? Hard work, dedication, commitment, right? So I, I live off those three things. And whatever I do, that's my mental approach. You know, I'm, I'm going to go out and, and work hard. I'm going to be dead. I'm going to commit myself to the goal, no matter what it takes. Like, the goal is, 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 is what it is. And no matter how I get there, like, I'm going to get there. Um, and so we took that and we just branched everything from that. You know, everything I do is, is part of this this system, this uh, lifestyle model. So the foundation was launched off of, off of that, and the foundation is all based off um, my approach and teaching and showing um, everybody how to do it. You know, it doesn't matter what field you're in. It doesn't matter if you want to be an athlete or businessman, a firefighter or a policeman. Um, you want to be into producing and, and podcasts and, and a photographer, whatever it is, whatever your 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 goal is whatever your career plan or path is you got to grind for that you got to put the time in you got to you got to network you got to talk you got to work you got to sacrifice and that's what understand the grind is you know and, and the whole point and the whole mission is 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 to relay that message and to motivate the next generation and motivate the next group you know to go after their goals and not not let anything hold them back absolutely i could say that uh, the message is definitely being being heard here in the city man for sure and i will say while we're on the topic i got to give you your flowers man there's a lot of uh, a lot of successful people that have come out of san diego and 
they've all, and I'm not judging, I'm not judging everyone can do what they want with their time and with their resources and everything. But from, from my standpoint, of all the people that have come from here to go on and do great things, you are someone that's still very hands-on with your city, very hands-on with your community. And it's not just, uh, it's not just lip service. It's not like, oh, I'll, I'll donate some money to the basketball program. I'll give some money to the school. Like, you're hands-on with the kids mm. here, with the community here, with the people here. Mm. And it's really commendable, bro. It's really, yeah, really I, dope to see. I appreciate that, man. It means a lot to me because um, I've, I've learned everything from my mom, right? My mom was um, a single parent. You know, she's the strongest woman I, I've ever met in my life, raising three kids on her own, um, ups, downs, struggles financially, whatever it was, she always figured it out. You know, and one thing, even no matter what we were going through um, at home as a family, she always gave back. She always cared about the next person. She was always about it takes a village. You know, she was always in the community, no matter what. I mean, whether it was more stress on her, you know, she was always giving back. And um, I learned from that, you know, and she, she taught us that. And, uh, you know, when you, when you see your mom or, or your parent doing that, it kind of hits home. And for me, I started to look at, okay, same way you like, you can do whatever you want with your time. And I was sat there like, man, I wish some of these other guys would, would come back and, and, and talk to us a little bit more and, and motivate us and just show us. You know, a lot of the guys that, that we know about um, who, who've gone and done great things, you know, they're kind of like a few places removed. You know, so we're, we're looking at it from like, oh, man, like, that's a generational thing, right? Like, there's nobody in the moment with us, right? It's everybody like five, ten, next generation away. Um, and there was nobody current. And I was like, man, when I, when I make it, uh, I'm going to be the one to give back, you know, because I know that feeling. I know how it is to, to meet, you know, a role model or somebody that you look up to and, and you know, they, they give you game and they help you. And, and those moments right there can really shape a player and shape a person and shape a young, young kid coming up. They're going to remember those moments. You know, even at my camp today, like kids showing me photos from the first uh, youth camp, you know, mm -hmm. and just seeing them develop and, and get older and come here and like their skills, it's like amazing feeling and seeing how much that they they appreciate, you know, me, me giving back to them and helping them um, grow themselves, not only as a, as a player, but as a person. Um, so I, I'm, I'm always like hands on as much as I can. Uh, I never forget where I came from. Um, I wouldn't be where I'm at if it wasn't for the life lessons uh, that I had, not only in Southeast San Diego, because we moved around a lot too. Um, but all, all of San Diego, you know, uh, I went through a lot of things, a lot of obstacles, ups and downs, and it really shaped me who I am as a person today. Mm -hmm. With uh, there, a lot goes on in San Diego that people that people don't know about, especially like with us being like right next to L.A. and people know all the great and the and the horrible about L.A. Um, but people don't always know. Not that it needs to be broadcast per mm -hmm. se, but some of like the things that go on in the inner city here in mm -hmm. San Diego. How are you able to kind of navigate away from those things and just stay focused on basketball um well my mom is really strict too okay. <laughs> you know uh, um growing up in, in, in southeast san diego you know uh, my mom when i was younger was, was over on skyline and like we said we moved around a lot where i was in linda vista back over here in southeast i was in sarah mesa like we, we were all over the place but um the roots was here in southeast and uh, one, my mom being super strict and not allowing, like, my mom wouldn't let me walk to the store. Like, th like there were okay. certain things that my mom would not let me do. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, like, some things you can't hi hide yourself from. Uh, but I think uh, my, my mom being a, a good, uh, strict and uh, parent at home, keeping us uh, away from a lot of things and, and keeping us focused. Uh, we couldn't do anything we wanted without having our, our grades and our schooling right. So whether I wanted to go over and hang out with my friends, whether I wanted to go play basketball, whether I just wanted to be out, like go to the mall, whatever, like I wasn't going nowhere without my grades. Um, so she had a, had a tight, ruled, you know, strict system at home that kind of like helped us navigate, you know, uh, being out on the street or doing whatever it is um, that the other kids was doing. Um, like we, we didn't have that regimen at home. So I think that really helped. Um, you know, kind of separate myself and focus on my goal. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, let's get back back into a little bit of the, the basketball journey. So after you, your junior year, you win the state championship, weren't able to climb that mountain and get back to a state championship your senior year. Uh, is, that, is that a sore spot? Is that still yeah, a sore spot? Yeah, a sore spot, man. Still, yeah. man. Still. Who'd you guys lose to? Uh, we lost to Summit my senior year at USC. I'll never forget that, man. I was uh -huh. so pissed. Uh -huh. was so pissed. Um did you play well? No, I didn't play well. I mean, like, if you look at the stats, like, okay, like, I had 20, whatever. But I, I shot I shot terrible. 
Um, it, was, it was a bad game for me, but mm-hmm. um, we were still, we still should have won. That, that's the thing that mad. Like, like we're up. Mm-hmm. Um, we should have won. Uh, I ain't gonna put Coach Jason Bryan on blast, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I thought some of the matchups in the second half kind of kind of hurt us. But they they also got hot. They also got hot. Some of their, they they did their thing. But mm-hmm. it was like set up for us to. I mean, we only lost two games um, that that whole that whole year. Mm-hmm. You know, like there was like nobody was gonna beat us but ourselves. Uh, but they got hot, um, and, and they, they did their thing. But we, we should definitely should have won. I just remember after that game, I was, I mean, boo-hooing. Mm-hmm. Boo-hooing because I, um, I, I had lost my uncle oh, man. Um, uh, to cancer, you know, and I dedicated that. I wanted to get back to the state championship. I wanted to win state for him. Um, so the fact that I didn't, I was just, like, super, like, mm-hmm. depressed and sad because, like, I felt like I let him down, you know. So, um yeah, it's a sore spot for me still to this day. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I wish I, if I'd known I would approach it a little yeah, different. That's all good. Now, you said you're, uh, if you don't mind me speaking, now, your uncle that passed away, was that the uncle that stepped in as the yeah, father figure yeah, for you? Uncle, yeah, I got, um, I got him tattooed right here. I don't know if y'all could see a little bit, but uh, my first tattoo was dedicated to my uncle, um, Raymond Edwards. Um, it's a little story behind it. He's, uh, we're, we are uh, really into religion, we're Christian faith. So um, it's a basketball in the praying hands because you got to start. He started in basketball, and part of the three pillars of understanding grind was hard work. So I have hard work over the top because you always told me with hard work anything's possible. That's dope. That's dope. Now you being a, you know, still being a kid and dealing with the loss of your father figure. How did you? How did you deal with that? Um, I didn't take it uh, too well. I didn't take it too well. I wanted to quit uh, and stop playing basketball. Uh, and the funny, the funny thing is, um, leading into my senior year. Uh, when I lost them, I had lost a lot of scholarships too. Um, so I stopped playing basketball. But um, uh, Dream Vision, a team that Tyree and Tyrell played on, uh, they came to me and like, oh man, like we want you to play, whatever, whatever. They're going back east, and um, I played one tournament with them before, and we did well. Um, and then after my uncle passed away, like I took a step back, and they came back that summer, like, oh, we're going, we're at the NY to LA, like. Like, can you come out and play? And I'm like, man, I really don't want to play. Like, no, it'll be good for you. You get, get your mind, whatever, whatever. And I played terrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, terrible. Um, and after that, that tournament, um, one of the schools that are called USC had told my high school coach that they're pulling my scholarship um, because he's like, oh, like, he's not the player that we thought he was, this, that, and the other. And so then following, going into my senior year, I killed it, right? Got back into the hoop, got right, um, and hooped. And they tried to re-offer me the scholarship, and my coach was like, "Nah, like he's not even coming to your school, just because you didn't you didn't believe in him." You right. know I mean, he was going through a hard time, and you. And this was SC. Yeah, this was USC. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they pulled the scholarship, and he's like, "Nah, I don't even offer him. Like it's over with." Wow. Uh, Props yeah, to that's them. crazy. Were you was USC one of the one of the top schools you were yeah, looking at? Yeah. So I mean, my my UCLA uh, peeps are gonna be mad at me, but uh, I was a USC fan uh, growing up. Uh, one because Reggie Bush, Same. you know, got San Diego great coming out, and then my uncle was a big USC uh, football fan. Okay. So, uh, and my my dad uh, was a UCLA fan, uh, but my my uncle, you know, was I used to have sit with him uh, college game day and with my USC pillow and sit there with my uncle and watch, and then they show all the UC, uh, USC grades, so Troy Palomalu, and I'm sitting there like, oh, like, I want to play football, like, uh-huh. I want to play football too, uh-huh. um, but. Uh, uh, that was the only only reason why like I was a USC fan. I got Reggie Bush and my uncle, but um, they pulled my scholarship, and um, UCLA was the school that um, stuck with me. Like they said, we we don't care. Like we know who you are, the player. We know you're going through um, a really tough time. Coach uh, Scott Garson, uh, who was uh, the main guy recruiting me, um, was at Lincoln calling Coach Jason um, at our practices, coming to the games, um, and, and they just showed full support not only to myself but my family. And that and I'm I'm a real like loyal loyal person and uh, for a school and uh, a coach to do that it really showed that they cared about me not only as a player but as a human nice yeah. and what was that what was it like getting to getting the poly pavilion stepping on campus for the first time oh, it was amazing man it was amazing for me because uh had you spent much time in la before going to school there yeah i mean we played a lot of uh tournaments up there i mean but i mean like as far as like like off the court had you been like in the city like had you spent time in the city of la before yeah so there? um uh my mom's uh friend uh miss elizabeth tate um her her mom uh, lives up in um, South Central, so okay. like, we'd go up there and visit. We had uh, track and field events up there, so we were, we were always in LA for something. Mm-hmm. You know, driving around, going to Santa Monica, visiting uh, different plot, uh, different parts. 
so LA was already our like second home for me. Um, uh, so going to LA, going to UCLA, uh, it was easy for me because I like as much as I wanted to go to SDSU because of the first early support, I needed to get out of San Diego, right? Because mm-hmm. so you just hear the stories, guys that stay home, they get in trouble, mm-hmm. they're around, it's easily distracted. I wanted to get away and uh, live my own life and, you know, have my own experiences and, and be my own man. Mm-hmm. So uh, UCLA was, like, just far enough to where, like, my family had to call me uh, mm-hmm. on the drive up, you know, two and a half, sometimes four hours right, of traffic, right. so uh-huh. I have time to be to myself. But they could also come out and support me and watch me play. Mm-hmm. Um, and my mom, like, she never, I was there four years, and she never missed a game. She had her own, they made her own award because she made it to every single wow. home game at UCLA all four years. Nice. Yeah, so hey, your mom's a real one. She don't play. Your mom's oh, yeah, a real my mom, one. My mom, like, for those that don't know, my mom is is a ride or die, and she is about whatever. Like, she's made so many trips, made so many sacrifices for me and my family. Like, not my, my family, but our family. Um, uh, like, I, I wouldn't be nowhere without her. Hey, hey, that's dope. That's dope. So you, what, what, was your, what was your major in college? Um, so I was a history major um, at UCLA. Uh, I took communications classes. Um, the funny story, um, at UCLA, UCLA was, I don't know if they still are, but when I, at the time I was there, UCLA is the only um, school that you have to apply to be a communications major. Right. Really? Yeah. So I want to be like uh, when I'm done with basketball and what I'm working on now is to be a sports broadcaster, commentator. Um, so I want to do communications for that. Um, so in your first quarter at UCLA, you have to have a 3.5 or above. Um, and I ended up with a 3.3. Mm. And even with uh, uh, letters of uh, recommendations from counselors and teachers, they still wouldn't let me in. Man. So uh, history has always been my favorite subject. So I, I majored in history. Oh, OK. Yeah. What, what was that? Uh you said it was your favorite way. You, are you like a history buff or was it just more like your favorite subject? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say like I'm a super history buff and I'm watching all these documentaries and things like that. It was my favorite subject. You know, I just love learning about where we were and how we got to where we're at. You mm-hmm. know, and, and uh, the, fav- the, the, the famous quote is history is always repeating itself. Right? Mm-hmm. So um, you have to learn from your history so you don't end up in the same hole. Um, I think that's what, like, what drew me to history, you know, um, learning about uh, where you come from, who you are, who your ancestors are. Um, how the government, you know, um, is made and based on the money and every like, everything is, is based off history. And if you know your history, you know yourself. Absolutely. So um, yeah, that that was my my favorite subject growing up in school. Absolutely. Now playing, uh, staying in school and playing all four years. At what point did the the NBA become <clears throat> realistic for you? Um, honestly, I think uh, my junior senior year. I mean, I went through. Uh, a lot of stuff my, my freshman and sophomore year, you know, a lot of promises, a lot of things that I thought were going to go. You know, everybody has that, like, oh, I'm going to go to, I'm going to be one and done. You know, I'm going to be one and, or two and done. Like, everybody coming out the league, going to the league out of college is a, is a freshman or a sophomore. And if you're a junior, senior, you know, you're kind of on the fence of not being able to make it. Um, so I, I came in there like, I'm, I'm about to be the man. We just want to stay. Like, I'm, I'm hottest in San Diego. Like, ain't nobody touching me. Um, and there were some promises and stuff that I, I thought were, were going to be made, but um, had to sit behind some guys, had to, you know, wait my turn. And one year turned into two years, two years turned into three years. Um, and we made a, a coaching change. And I think making that coaching change kind of opened back up my offensive game because Coach Allen was such a defensive-oriented guy, such a system-oriented guy that a lot of guys who play in, like, the free-flow um, transition-style basketball uh, kind of struggled in the half court. And uh, when we got Coach Alfred, he was more up and down, fast paced, move the ball, attack the rim, get open and good looks. And that's my game. Athletic ability, being able to score um, and playing uh, transition, that kind of opened up my offensive game and gave teams like, oh, like, he could be able to, to, to do a little bit both on both ends of, of the floor coming out. So uh, my college four years wasn't all good, but I went through a lot of things that helped prepare me for the league coming out, um, staying on four years. Mm-hmm. What was your what was your, your process preparing for the draft and going through workouts and everything? How was uh, that? My process was I'm going to outwork and dominate everybody. It didn't matter who was in front of me. You know, I knew who the guys were. Uh, and the top guards. I knew who were going to be the top picks. Like I, I, I feel like, like I said, the going through college and going through the ups and down coaches changes, being promised you're going to play, sitting on the bench, you know, being a star guy, not being a star guy, like all helped me um, in my development and my approach into the league. And so coming out of uh, college, 
um, I was ready for it. You know, I, I was ready for whatever they threw at me. But I said, I'm, I'm gonna dominate everybody. With whoever they got in front of me, I'm going at. And, and that's how we went. I did um, 19 or 20 pre-draft workouts. Wow. Um, I worked up. I had, uh, up until the night before the draft. Day before the draft, I worked for the. I had a workout for the Lakers. A second workout for the Lakers. Day before the draft, um, going up against uh, Anthony Brown. They wanted to see who they were gonna pick. Um, and it was a crazy process, but my whole approach was go after everybody. Mm-hmm. And so for, for a guy in your position, it was really just whoever chooses me, right? Yeah, because, um, you know, you, you got to break down. Like, I was coming out four years. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew I wasn't going to be a lottery pick. Right. right. So right. Um, looking at your draft stock, I was probably mid to late um, first, um, early second round. And so I'm looking at the teams that I worked out for, the guys that I went up against, and I dominated some of the guys that they had um, in their guard spot uh, above me in the shooting guard position. So right around, like, the 20th pick, I started, like, really, like, okay, like, I worked out for the Raptors. You know, they, they selected Delon Wright. I worked out uh, for Cleveland. They selected somebody overseas. Like, I worked out, looking, I worked out for the Lakers. Okay, they got the 20th, they had the 27th pick. They took Larry Nance. And then they had the 32nd pick, and they took Anthony Brown, who I worked out with the day before. So, like, around those, I started, like, knocking those. Okay, okay, okay. And then as soon as they, the guys that I was like, okay, I, I dominated this dude, and this dude was getting taken above me, mm-hmm. um, it, I, I was getting pissed. I was like, man, I'm about to leave. I had a draft party, everything down uh, downtown San Diego, and I'm slipping and sliding, you know, back further and further back. And I'm like, man, this is some BS, dog. Like, they not, I'm not going to get drafted, yeah, right? They yeah. in the 40s. And um, I just remember, like, literally about to leave my draft party, and uh, my coach, uh, is telling me like to look up. I'm calling, like I'm going through it with my agent, a lot of backstory stuff, but I'm going through it with my agent. And I just remember my coach. Uh, I look up. Your name got you're like your name just got called. And name came across the ticker, uh, 46 pick. Uh, and I'm just like, yeah. And I just start <laughs> crying, uh-huh. crying crazy. Um, and uh, as soon as the next pick came out. I was traded to Toronto, and I kind of started feeling better because that was the best workout I had. I went okay. up against Rashad Vaughn, mm-hmm. um, coming out of UNLV. I, I, they still talk about that pre-draft workout in Toronto to this day, um, and it was just like like a full circle, full moment. You know, being drafted, one having your name called, but then ending up at a place where you thought and saw yourself being. That's dope. That's dope. What's it like? What's it like getting to Canada? Going getting to a new country? Was it any you experience any culture shock or like what's it like getting used to a new country? Um, it was it was it was different, but I, I loved it. Like so, my pre-draft workout. Um, you know, they pick you up at the airport, and we go down to um, Jurassic Park, um, Maple Leaf Square, and I, I get out the car, and like I remember, I vividly to this day, I see it in my. They have the big, big TV screen out there where everybody watches the game during the playoff. Got Leisure Main Hotel on my right. They got the Delta Hotel behind me, Rogers um, Stadium, uh, where uh, the Blue Jays play. And it's nighttime, but the, the city got the lights going. I'm like, I got it was just a feeling like, this is where I need to be. Like, oh, this is nice. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. this, this is this is it. Um, so like being able to actually go there and experience it was amazing. It was a little little different, you know. They they put the R R E instead of E R. You know, you, um, you're looking for certain milks. They got bagged milk, and mm-hmm. you're looking for the carton or, or or the plastic bottles. So there's a little different uh, culture shock, but. Um, uh, it was amazing. I mean, the people there are amazing. Uh, I have nothing bad to say about Toronto besides it's cold as hell up there. Uh-huh. Um, that's the only thing I didn't like. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and everybody gets to laugh when I say that. But um, I, I love being in, in Canada and just not only just Toronto, but being able to experience all of uh, of Canada, the whole country, going to Vancouver, going to Edmonton, going to Montreal, going to Quebec. Like we, we were able to travel and see everything. And every place was had their, her own unique feel and set up but uh, the people there were amazing and super supportive Mm -hmm. one thing i never thought about until i heard until i heard Jalen rose who played who played for the raptors him talking about it he's like you got to keep in mind he's like every other team they got like a city or maybe a state behind them he's like Mm -hmm. if you play for the raptors you got a whole country you got a country behind i never thought about that crazy it's like y'all like rock stars anyway you know you're the only you're the only team right but like after they moved vancouver Mm -hmm. you know and they they got the expansion the raptors like we're the only team vince you know put the put basketball on the map for toronto um vince carter if uh they don't know i don't want to say vince and just leave him up but 
uh, Vince Carter, you know, like did his thing and, and put basketball on the map, and it's just been steady growing. And now, you know, you, you see you see the talent that that Canada has in in the league, uh, but like like the support is great. I mean, it, it's so bad. And it's one thing that I do like now that um, I'm in LA because when you're no matter where you're at, like eyes are on you in Canada. Like you can't even go to I see. restaurants, you can't go to the mall, like you can't walk down the street. At least in LA, at least um, or where I, I live in Vegas um, in, in the off season, uh, you can walk around and, and you might get a, like, oh, what's up here and there from a few people, but mm-hmm. other than that, people are minding your business. You know, mm-hmm. in LA, you got so many different. Uh, level actors, stars there, like, like you're just another person out there, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. I like. You right, know, I like right. being super low key. Mm-hmm. But in Canada, like you can't go nowhere. <laughs> no, and don't go to Vancouver or somewhere where they don't have the Raptors. Like uh-huh. you're getting mobbed. It doesn't matter. So uh, that's one thing that I do like about being <laughs> away from Canada is that mm-hmm. you kind of I can kind of be back to like being myself and being low key and moving around and just, just enjoying my time as a regular person. I feel, I feel. Did you have a Did you have much of a relationship with Kawhi before he came to Toronto? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, my mom and Kawhi's mom uh, have been friends for a really long time. Oh, wow. Um, uh, like I said, SDSU um, mm-hmm. uh, was the first team that, that uh, recruited me and offered me a scholarship, and we would be at SDSU all the time. We'd be at their games, watching them play, um, everything. Um, and so being able to meet Kawhi, going on my official visit, um, and putting you know the pieces together. I mean, he was always super supportive of me when uh, I was in the league, and he was in San, T- San Antonio. Um, I remember uh, we, were, we were in a club in Toronto when they came and played, and he had told somebody to come get me, and he had uh, you know, we had chopped it up in, in the club a little bit. He's like, man, whatever you need, whenever you're back in, in San Diego, let me know, hit me up, um, and I got you. Um, so he was always there. Every time we played, he was always showing love. Um, so I was excited when we got him uh, in, in Toronto. What's it like playing with him? I'm sure a lot of people ask that, and yeah. it's going to be a quick little thing. It's your interview. Yeah. Uh, he's a, for me, I, how do I say this? I, obviously, he's like a pretty like reserved, quiet dude. Mm-hmm. But I've seen like a, like a few things here and there where I'm like, nah, I feel like he's like a pretty like, yeah. You know what I mean? He just, when the cameras are around, he's like, I don't know y'all, so I'm going to be pretty reserved. Yeah, nah, I, I, yeah. And, and, he, and he's still like that, um, like uh-huh. around us, you know, but like, he's, a, he's a reserved person, you know, mm-hmm. he's quiet, like he's, but but he's normal too. Like people think he's just like this robot that doesn't have no emotion. And Kawhi's funny as hell, man. Like, it, like if you're around him and you hear him talk, and the things he say, he won't even tell. It, like it's not even like a full joking conversation. He'll say three words, man, and it'd be funny as hell. He starts <laughs> laughing, just whatever the situation is, right? He just playing off, the, and it'd be funny as hell. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, it, it, he's, he's, he's normal, man. He, he's interested in the normal things. Um, he does normal things. Like uh, he's just, he's. I just don't think he's like into what everybody else is interested in, right? right? The right. the media part of it, the 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 Instagram, the Twitter and things like that. Like he's not into it. he's not in it to be out there and, and show me who I are cuz I want to be famous, you know. He like mm-hmm. he knows what he likes and he's he, and he's cool and comfortable in his box. You know, he's kind of like me, but he's maybe on a like a step or two higher. Like I'm comfortable in my box, I operate in my box and like I don't feel the need or or want to have to go outside of that. I don't have a fear of missing out and I don't think he has that same thing. Like he's mm-hmm. cool at operating how he operates. Mm-hmm. I hear you. I hear you. So Kawhi comes in and you guys make that title run. Tell, talk to me about that season, how, how special that season was and what's, what it's like winning an NBA championship. Um, I still can't believe that I'm an NBA champion to this day. Uh, but it was just different, man. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I can't not talk about that season without talking about the previous season with DeMar and Kyle. Like DeMar like did his thing, you know. He he really took over after. He's one of my favorite players. Yeah, uh, she was my favorite player um, uh, when I was in high school watching watching college. You know, um, him and Nick Young. I was a USC fan, so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, him and Nick Young. I used to watch uh, his, his highlights in Coach Jason's classroom. Uh, I remember him jumping over a dude baseline uh, when he's at Compton. Uh, but being able to play with him was uh, another moment for me. But um, you know, he did his thing, so it was like like a bittersweet moment seeing my my big bro. Um, get traded, you know, and however it went down. Um, but, uh, you know, he, 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 set, he set us up to be able to win that championship. Without DeMar, we don't get Kawhi, right? Without everything that he did for uh, not only the organization but Canada, like, the championship doesn't happen. I don't care what nobody says, right? Mm-hmm. Without, without that body of work that he did to get us to where we're at, um, we, don't, we don't win that championship. So shout out to my boy DeMar. Um, for everything he did for for the Raptors and 
for the country of Canada. But that season when we got Kawhi, it was just different. Like I can't even explain it. There's not like like a breakdown. It was just different, man. Like when he came into training camp and the approach it was just it was just a different feel mm-hmm. from from day one. And it just carried, you know, I think just like who he was as a player, him coming off that San Antonio system and just how like Focus he was in his approach day in and day out, taking care of his body. You know, he, he gets a lot of flack now for like the injuries and things like that. But that dude is so diligent with his approach every single day. You know, like it, it's not a day where he's not working on his game, whether it's on the floor or doing stuff in the weight room to make sure um, he can he can go every single night uh, or as much as he can. You know, uh, but it was a different feel that whole season. And then when we got to the playoffs, we made we made some trades. We we, we got Marcus Saw. He really helped uh, solidify like the defensive, offensive big man for us, um, which we needed. You know, to go up against Joel Embiid. Uh, but man, like he's an animal, man. He's an animal. Hey, hey, he's an animal. To get to win the championship, short. No, I want to say shortly after, but a few years later, you you, you end up in Portland. End up playing one, another one of the best players in the league, who's actually my, my favorite player to this day, Damian mm-hmm. Lillard. Tell me about, talk to me about your time in Portland and, and, and what that was like. It was short, man. It, it was short. It was but definitely I had, short. Yeah, I had a great time. I, I had a great time uh, while I was there. Um, I was mad that they traded for me because I didn't want to leave, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> leave Toronto. Um, but uh, it, it was great, man. Just seeing him operate. You know, you see from afar, you see the crazy numbers he's putting up. Uh, and just just how he's able to take over a game, like he he can carry a team not only just for game time fourth quarter, but he can carry a team all four quarters, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, make it look super effortless. Um, so to be able to, to to team up and play alongside him and CJ, um, the the two headed monsters that have been killing the, the Western Conference uh, for so long, uh, was a lot of fun. You know, I got to pick uh, different things of how they approach the game and what they work on and, and how. You know, he gets his shots off and the shots that he work on to shoot super deep threes like like their layups. Uh, I mean, but he, he he's another one. He's a unique, skilled, uh, individual talent, um, generational talent, one of the best uh, off the dribble shooters I've ever seen uh, up close and in person um, and a great dude, too. You know, super low key, super humble, um, fun to be around. Um, He's a great dude, man. Uh, I love Damon. Even though it was uh, half a season, half a season, uh, I had a great time in Portland. Mm-hmm. I got got to backtrack a little bit. You said, was it that you didn't want to go to Portland or you didn't want to leave Toronto? I didn't want to leave Toronto. And now, like, I didn't want to gonna go to Portland. You know, mm-hmm. I, like wherever wherever I play, like right. you, you got me. Professional. But I didn't want right. to leave Toronto. If I'm being dead serious, I wanted to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, I always felt that. Um, the team that we had, the youth that we had, um, that core that we had, mm-hmm. um, could have been what Boston is now, mm-hmm. right? If we kept us all together, I mean, Fred, uh, Pascal, OG, me. I mean, we, we lost some other guys, DeLon Wright, Yaka Pirtle, but we had a solid group of guys. Uh, Chris Boucher, uh, I don't want to leave nobody out, but they know who I'm, they know they, that, your, that young core that we, we were rocking with in Toronto. We always thought that we were going to be the next up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as like Kyle and um, those guys got older, um, we lost Serge and, and Mark. Uh, it was going to be our time, you know, to, to really carry and show that all of us was developing, all of us was coming into our own. Um, so we were just ready, like, okay, Kyle, Kyle's probably on his last last year um, with the team. He's probably going to uh, go somewhere where he can, you know, uh, fight for a championship. Um, and it was like, man, we're next up. And that, that was our mentality. And like, whenever I was talking to Fred Pascal, I was like, man, we next up. Like, we ready to take this over? That, that's how we were looking at it. Um, so um, we had that approach. And when I got traded, man, it was just, it, it hurt. It hurt. And, and it hurt Fred, too. Uh, Fred, Fred hit me. He's like, man, like, like this one hurt. Like, because we always thought that this was, this was going to be us. We were going to be where Boston's at. Mm-hmm. Um, one or two more additions, and we were right there. So I mean, I, I didn't want to leave Toronto. I thought we had something special. Was that kind of like you hear you hear uh, professional athletes talk about like, well, it's a business. Was that kind of like your first like? Well, I guess I guess Demar leaving was kind of probably your first introduction. Yeah, I think that that the the Demar situation. I don't want to say it's not my situation, but you mm-hmm. know the stuff that was put out about that. Uh, you know, is, is the shock to know that it's the business, and, and I understand it. You know, I understand both sides. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, everything I've been through in my in my career, in my life, you know, I, I have an open mind and perspective on on everything. Right, mm-hmm. it's never one sided for me. 
Um, so I understand the business of it, you know, and the aspect of it, the money play of it. Like I'm on, I'm about to be a free agent. Money play, I'm going to demand a lot more than if you trade for somebody who's younger and you can take a shot on and figure out the contracts at that point in time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, I see that I see that side of it. Um, and at first, you know, you, you take it personal, like, man, you don't want me. Like, what, 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 what am I doing wrong? Like, I was hooping, too. Like, I was cooking. Mm-hmm. Like, those guys were out with COVID, and I, I was averaging, I think, 25, shooting 40%, 42 from three, 50% from the field. Like, I was cooking the league. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, man, like, I was shocked when they, when they traded me. Um, but uh, but you, you see the business of it, and you start to understand it, and you kind of take the, the personal out of it. You know what I'm saying? And, like, man, you got to – it's basketball. What are you going to do? Quit and not go play? Nah, like, this team wants me over here, and I'm going to go out there and give them my all. Mm-hmm. I hear you. I hear you. So now you're in L.A. playing for the Clippers. Was um, I've, I've been a Lakers fan my entire life. Still a Lakers fan. Been so a Lakers good. fan my entire life. Growing up Kobe, but man. I'm, Kobe exactly. And see, but see, I'm different, though, in... I root for the Clippers, though. Like, mm-hmm. I'm a, I've San Diego all day. But I'm originally from the L.A. area. Mm-hmm. And so I've always rooted for the L.A. teams. It mm-hmm. was the Lakers first. And then the Clippers, and then I root for Portland because I like Dame. Mm-hmm. But so I'm, I'm different though. I'm a Lakers fan that actually roots for the Clippers. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now for you, obviously, like it's uh, it's different now because like growing up, the Clippers weren't very good. Mm-hmm. But now with you guys, you guys are a very yeah. good team. What's it like um, playing for the being being a Clipper in with all due respect in the Lakers city and like making making the name as a Clipper and all that? What's that like? Um, I'm I'm glad that I. I, I came when I uh, when I came into the team right um, right right because um, kind of skipped the building blocks uh-huh. to be you know uh, uh-huh. to get underneath from underneath the shadow of the Lakers like like you're still there right because I mean they got championships right so whenever you get to talking about how good the team is compared to this team this season or that season everybody from the Lakers is going to turn around well how many championships you got mm-hmm. how many championships so you're always going to be underneath the the Lakers because you don't have a championship yet mm-hmm. right so I think once we get a championship, you know, we'll be able to poke our chest out a little bit more. But, you know, uh, the guys that came before us, you know, they, they, they put the work in to, to keep building. Like, we're not, even though, like, a lot of people see us as, like, the, the team right below, we're not. Right? Like, we're, we're, we're right there. We're, we're, we're primed for, for a championship. You know, we just need um, everything to come together the right way. You know, and that's what it takes to win a championship. You need everything to come together the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think uh, in the last few years, especially acquiring – PG and, and Kawhi, you know, things just haven't clicked yet, like where everything is, is, is moving, everybody's healthy, everybody's able to make that postseason push. And I, I got a lot of flack for talking about it uh, when we won the championship in Toronto, but things have to go the right way, right? Guys have to step up. It's, it's basketball. Like, nobody's going to just run through um, the postseason. You know, certain things have to happen the right way and to go in your favor to win a championship. And and for us, you know, in these past few years, it's just haven't, you know, we haven't had both guys fully healthy throughout the duration of the postseason, right? Mm-hmm. Which is what you need. You know, you have some, you have a chance. I mean, they had it in the bubble, right? The collapse in the bubble happened. But uh, besides that one uh, postseason, um, we haven't been fully healthy. You know, it's always been one or the other and then both. Um, so... Uh, I just want to see what it looks like. T. Lewis talked about it. Like we want to see what it looks like with everybody healthy. Like when we go in this postseason, everybody healthy, everybody on the right page. Then we can see are, are we that team. Until then, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of h- uh, tough to be like, well, they're not really that good. Oh, the, like we got to be healthy. You see, Denver. You know, they didn't win a championship until Jamal Murray got healthy, right? Mm-hmm. And now they they fully loaded. They made some additions. They got uh, Aaron Gordon. They had. Bruce Brown step up and, and, and Braun step up and guys make plays. Uh, uh, not well, uh, KCP um, um, step up and hit shots and make plays, which is what happens through the course of um, these seven game series. But um, you need a fully lo- you need your team. You need your team fully loaded um, to take on these teams because everybody's so focused on you for seven games. Right. Mm-hmm. So you need your guys, uh, your superstar players there. And so hopefully this year, you know, we can uh, enter the postseason, you know, and, and be in a better p- spot through the seeding and all that and, and give ourselves a chance to compete for this championship. You've had, you've had quite, I feel like I know the answer to this. Well, okay, I'll say, I'll say I have a favorite highlight of yours. Of all the highlights that you've had, you know, buzzer beaters, dunks, what's your favorite highlight to date so far? Highlights and plays made, right? Not just... Right, right, okay. right, right. Uh, 
I got two. Okay. I got two. Um, my first one is, well, I, I should say I have three. Okay. Um, my first one was where in, in Toronto where Playoff Power was created. Um, we was playing against PG in Indiana, and I was a rookie. Um, and I stole the ball from him. We, we went on a crazy, we were down, too. PG was cooking us all series. But we were down, and we were coming on a crazy run. And um, I remember guarding PG um, up the floor, and he came over pin down, and I shot the passing lane and got the steal, came down, and they called it the Superman dunk um, after. But I just came down and off two feet, mm-hmm. cocked it back, and I lost the ball in the air, right, and re- like regathered it midair and dunked it down to tie the game up. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my first, like, favorite highlight, and, like, they, it's still on commercials in Canada. I, I was just tagged recently in, in the play. Like, on this day, Playoff Power was born. Oh, dope. That's dope. Um, That's so dope. Um, that was my, my first highlight because I was a rookie. Uh, my second one was when I dunked on Anthony Davis um, in Toronto my, my second year. Um, and then my third one was this year when I dunked on Julius Randle. Mm-hmm. That's my favorite. Um, That's yeah. My favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, was a, there was a lot of aggression in that dunk uh-huh. and um, just the development of it just because – the previous play, they didn't call a foul, and mm-hmm. I was pissed mm-hmm. off, man, because uh, it should have been a foul. And so the ball swung around, and I ripped, ripped to the middle. And it, it, it didn't matter who it was. Uh, like, I just was – I was tearing that rim down because mm-hmm. I remember the coach, man, just go dunk it then. Uh-huh. All right, don't worry about it. <laughs> I came down and just – I put all my might into it and, and dunked it, and it was, like, in the garden. And uh-huh. you just hear – you just hear the whole, like, even Knicks fans was like, yo, uh-huh. right, like going right. crazy. <laughs> like my boy, he, who's from Harlem, um, he was in there with his mom, and uh, he's a diehard Knicks fan, and even he was like, going crazy. Nice. So uh, that 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 play uh, was was uh, definitely uh, one of my favorites. Uh, probably like the most like like uh, energetic. I bet. Is the Guardian your favorite place to play? Ah. Uh, it's up there just because of the, the, the historical mm-hmm. um, behind it, the history behind it. But um, honestly, my favorite place to play, my favorite arena to play in is uh, uh, the, the Miami Heat Arena, man. Really? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know what it is, but I, I love playing there. Uh, I say it's the, the, the South Beach weather. Like, it, just, mm-hmm. it just feels good. You know, like the body's loose. It's, it's nice and warm there. Um, I, I just love the energy in the arena. Mm-hmm. Um, D Wade uh, was somebody I modeled my game after. Um, so uh, watching him play and and all the things that he did there uh, for the Heat, you know, I just it's a good feeling to be in there. Hey. Uh, yeah, I like playing in, in hey. Miami. Well, some of your uh, some of your goals for this coming season. Uh, personal of, goals. I know the team has goals. What's some of your yeah, personal? Goals? I mean, for me, uh, I, I always put put my goals really high. You know, I, I want to be. I'm not. I'm not shy about that. Like, I want to be an All Star. Um, I want to have the opportunity, you know, to, to, to be one of the go-to guys. Um, and, and that's just me. You know, there's no shot against the team or whatever. That's my approach every single season. Like, if you if you don't have goals, lofty goals and uh, aspirations, you're selling yourself short, you know. So I always look at how I can get better, how I can improve, and how I can take my game to the next level, right? So um, I feel like I've, I've mastered the different roles that I've been put in throughout the course of my career, and I, I want to take that next step. You know, I want to be a, be a focal point. Um, night in and night out, and I feel like I've shown it in spurts that I can. Um, I think I've shown it uh, this past playoffs with, with, with Kawhi going out in those three games um, and being the main guy up and down, figuring it out how to uh, make winning plays not only for myself but for my team and, and give ourselves a chance. But you know, I want to be an All Star, uh, not just once. You know, um, I want to be uh, multiple. I want multiple uh, All Stars. So. That's my, my personal goal for myself. I don't have, like, numbers, stats, awards, uh, six men of the year, this, that, and the other. Everybody, I, oh, you want to be, like, no, I want to be an all-star, and I want to win a championship. Um, and that's how I approach every single season. That's dope, man. I see it for you, bro. We'll, we'll all be rooting for you and voting for you here in San Diego, yeah, man. Absolutely, that, man. absolutely. My guy, when I, started, when I started my broadcast career, man, yeah. it was, you was one of the one of my main uh, San Diego interviews really, that I wanted to man. do, man. I so the fact that, that I was I able to check it off. At, at Muni and everything. And yep. You, Yep. He was filming, man. Absolutely. So I'm glad Absolutely. I was able to, to come out. And, and it worked, you know. It's just the toughest thing for me is, like, not being in San Diego. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I'm in Vegas now. That's where I, where I live primarily. 
So like the commuting back and forth and trying to get, I'm like here for a day and then mm-hmm. I'm gone. I'm here for mm-hmm. or 36 hours and I'm gone. So mm-hmm. like trying to find a knockout time. So I'm. I'm I hear you, man. I know how it goes. I know how it goes. I was gonna, I was gonna keep asking it until it happened. I yeah, never no, take sure. offense when you can't make it. And then nah, I know how it goes. Nah, I know how it goes. I was able to make it happen. Man. My guy, I appreciate you giving me the time, no bro. Problem, for real, man. man. Thank you. No it was a real problem, honor, man. Yes, sir. It's been another episode of On the Mic with Michael Flicks. I appreciate you guys tapping in, man. Till next time. Take care. Sir. Thanks, man. Yeah, man. Thanks, man. That's a dream come true, bro. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, bro.